Thank you so much for welcoming us to the to the second day of this exciting symposium. Um, it was a pleasure to already join some of the discussions yesterday. Um, and yeah, so here we are presenting uh, this work to you, which is still a bit of a work in progress as we've been continuously um, following what's been going on in, in Berlin um, throughout the last months. And we continue to adapt um, as the context evolves, as it did very recently now, which, uh, which has been very exciting. Um, Mena, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so before we before we delve into the the main argument that we seek to make, um, I think it was Manuel Lutz, who I see is here today as well, who raised the question yesterday about um, the nuances between illegality, informality, and how how are we using these, um, and that hopefully we'll be having some construction constructive discussions about that um, throughout these days. And indeed, before I'd like, I'd kind of like to unpack how we how we have been approaching um, illegality and informality in our work, um, which actually I'm, I'm happy and excited that uh, Emily Kelling is here today because we used uh, her and Colin Marx's approach to knowing uh, urban informalities um, to approach informality and illegality through the through the two critiques that they posed um, in that paper, one being the imprecision of informality um, as a binary, um, and the second being informality um, as a as a way in which that which is beyond the West is increasingly known. Um, and uh, and yeah, that, that that also leads us to um to to a comment on on seeing the northwest. Um, as a as a region or as a geographical place, um, as opposed to what Abdul Malik Simon would argue is, uh, could be a condition, following his uh, his theory of the near south as an urban condition rather than a world region, and so we posit that um, that the northwest could indeed be seen as a condition that illegality is part of. Um, and if illegality is part of that, or at least nuances or degrees of illegality are part of that to address um, the second critique of Kelling and, and Marx, um, then, then we, we realize that, that very different, like I said, degrees of this illegality emerge. And especially in the context of Berlin, um, it's fascinating to see how by, by making this seem or making this be part of the of the con of the condition, um, and as the events evolve, especially in terms of the legal framework, um, various various degrees evolve over time that sometimes are even paradoxical. Um, Mena, you can go to the to the next slide, um, which now leads me to infrastructural citizenship. Um, Charlotte Lemansky, I don't I'm. Assuming most of you, or some of you will be familiar with this, um, defines infrastructure, conceptualizes infrastructure as the material objects and the social relations that create the lived environment. While citizenship is defined as the relationships, rights, and responsibilities and expectations between the state and citizens that manifest in legal rules, everyday acts, and radical practices. Um, and this is the introduction, or this is supposed to show you how we are bridging this concept. Um, to housing illegality, where we're seeing housing um, as a form of infrastructure in the context of Berlin, um, and and are trying to understand illegality through a notion of citizenship, and uh, and we're studying how this notion of citizenship evolves as the legal framework um, in Berlin is evolving. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, and the reason why this concept is so relevant to our research is because Lemans Lemansky argues that it serves as a lens to understand uh, state society relations. And it's a language that includes all urban dwellers, which um, in line with the theme of this conference is, is so important, right? We're trying to pinpoint how, um, how and why illegality and informality are not only um, something that should be associated with certain minorities, but something that transcends cities um, or the conditions the condition of cities um, in the in the urban northwest um, 
And she argues that citizenship is, is also about identities, perceptions, and actions of citizens who are deeply embedded in the system created by the state and thereby allows to pursue um, and see this process that is always in the making, which again, in, in this specific case in Berlin that Mena will be elaborating on after me is fascinating because we're, we're seeing this process of always in the making um, as the law builds upon itself um, through different cases. Um, and I, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, this now leads us to the concept of detabooing, which in the last decade has uh, has gained increasing attention, as you can see here in the screenshot, um, in the medical sector, uh, specifically addressing uh, medically controlled dying in the Western world of today, um, but has also gained traction in certain sociological discussions and also those about the urban. Um, and Martin and Ginold explore the different, different stages um, of detabooing and argue that the transcendence um, of a taboo must be con is conditionalized um, and that it eventually turns into a formalized legal positioning. Um, and in the case of Berlin, it's very interesting to realize and to study how this um, how, a ta how taboos are depending on, on this formalized legal positioning, which constantly evolves um, and triggers discussions about almost the, the auto-tabuization or detabuization of the law itself, as like, like I said, in the, in, in the latest developments where laws make previous laws retrospective um, or change, change a certain um, position to, towards a previous law that was supposedly formalizing uh, a legal position. Um, and they argue, Martin and Ginnold argue, that when we transcend the taboo, um, we need to regulate it. Um, and in this logic, criticism is an, is an attempt to re-taboo, uh, while defending, uh, what they call defending, is an attempt to de-taboo. Um, but now, just a very brief, before I lead on to Mena, can you go to the next slide again, please, by the way? Um, I'd, I'd quickly like to share the methodological approach that we've been taking at this with you so far. Um, although we hope that the, the discussion after our presentation um, will be an open discussion about this as well, because we we definitely welcome any, any other insights that you'd be willing to share with us. Um, but so far, we've been um, looking at how we can uh, we can address the two concepts, the concepts of detabooing and this uh, pinpointing of different degrees of illegality through a mixed me methods approach. Um, so this, this notion of detabooing is one we're trying to address through legal discourse analysis in which we're specifically studying the language that is being used at the different stages of the different legal judgments um, that have been passed in Berlin. Uh, specifically regarding the Gesetz zur Mietbegrenzung und Wohnungswesen, which I assume not all of you understand, um, which is also known as the Mietendeckelgesetz, which is the rental cap law um, that has been negotiated in Berlin for the past year. Um, and, uh, and which relates back to a point that Dr. Bazuderan, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, was making yesterday, but in which illegality sometimes becomes a condition actively produced by the state and the law. And we're seeing um, this specifically in the development of these different judgments, um, where different degrees of illegality are being conditioned um, by the state and the law, which now uh, leads me to the degrees of illegality, which we're trying to um, pinpoint and study through focus groups of um, tenants and homeowners in Berlin. Um, to which, again, if any of those are amongst the ones in the audience today, we're still uh, expanding um, and trying to look for individuals who would be willing to be part of some of these focus groups. Um, so feel free to get in touch with us afterwards. Um, but the idea of this is to get tangible and, and critical nuances that might not be as accessible through, through any other form of research. Um, and lastly, um, I'd like to just, again, uh, connect back to Dr. Vazudaran's exciting lecture yesterday 
and two of the dimensions of the spatial grammar of informal housing that he introduced to us, which I think are particularly relevant to the research that we're presenting today. And um, one being the dimension of informality and subjectification, where he posed the question of how are which laws forming specific subjects or which kind of subjects are which laws forming? And that's specifically a question that really relates with the work we're doing. And the second one is um, understanding how the law serves as a technology of dispossession. Um, and standing in solidarity with the with the residents of Berlin today, um, we unfortunately were witnessing the law um, probably serving increasingly as a technology of dispossession in the current context. Um, and that's where I pass the floor on to Minna, who will be introducing you and elaborating more on what's happening in Berlin. Yes. Thank you, Eunice, and thank you, everyone, uh, for being part of our session today. So actually, when we started speaking about uh, like how to develop the argument of illegality in housing in the global north and specifically in Germany and in Berlin as a case, we uh, were very much thinking about the um, recent increase in uh, rising for uh, rent in the different housing markets in, uh, in Berlin. I live in Germany and uh, during the past year, we actually witnessed different changes in the law with regard to the rental cap as uh, Jonas mentioned earlier. And there are three important dates um, uh, to, to mention with regard to this. The first one is February 2020, when we started to, uh, um, to, to hear about the rumors of the rental price cap. And at this time, personally, uh, uh, the rent that I used to pay uh, stayed the, the same. And uh, the idea was from the landlord that we are waiting until the final um, um like the final uh, court decision, which was supposed to be in September. However, in um, this took longer. And in October, the Landlords Association attempted to stop uh, the rent reductions by the rental cap law. And uh, however, in uh, November, this these attempts failed and the rental legislation came into force and was dated retrospectively. In fact, despite that it was dated um, uh, retroactively, uh, this did like it didn't always happen in all by all the landlords. So for me, for example, it just that starting November we started to pay the lower rental price, but at the same time, it is considered something legal. And from this, we started to think about how legality and illegality is very much also a uh, relative and uh, a term in term of perception to the um, uh, state regulations and to the federal law. Um, to give you more details about the rental cap law, it is a legislation about the rental prices and uh, that it cannot be raised for five years and to stay fixed uh, to June 2019 rates. And it was estimated that um, more than um, 3,500 3, uh, households are eligible for this uh, rent reduction, and that around more than 70% of Berliners were actually supportive of these plans of uh, freezing. However, uh, last week, uh, actually this uh, Berlin rental cap was overturned by the federal government because it was um, uh, rendered illegal with the federal law of uh, of housing and that it is not legal that it, that a um, on the state level that there will be a, a housing regulating um, law this was um this became even more interesting actually as we present today our case of berlin as a, a case for detabooing informality and illegality in specific uh, in housing in the global uh, north and global west and at the same time it's it became more interesting to discuss them, uh, our argument of degrees of illegality, which I will, I will come to later again. Um, this unregulation, um, uh, this brings us also to the question of unregulation or deregulation. And um, it, it was interesting to see that, for example, there are different uh, campaigns going on, uh, trying to um, also like not only German German speaking campaigns, but also to address um, like a, a, an affordable city for all. And um, I think this campaign was going on since few months, but at the same time, it uh, it was not successful in keeping the rental law uh, in place. Um, in particular, we would like to mention uh, the work of uh, El Said, who are speaking about medieval modernity, or what they call it, on this uh, intersection of citizenship and urbanism in a more globalized era. And um, 
and and he mentions that if a formality operates through the fixing of value, including the mapping of spatial value, then in fact um, informality operates through the constant negoti negotiate like negotiations of value. And we are interested to look at it from a um, negotiating and unnegotiating order perspective, but also to start seeing Berlin more more as a new liberal capital for socialists. So um, if housing illegality was used to make an inclusive law, which arguably reduced informality, uh, um, is rendered illegal, then in this case, uh, we argue that housing was detabooed both as a source and as an agent of illegality. Um, so um, we anticipate several findings, as we mentioned, our methodology of um, like critical uh, legal discourse analysis and, and focus group discussions with um, including different actors. But also we anticipate uh, to, uh, uh, to see findings in relation to seeing housing becoming an agent and citizens becoming um, uh, more as subjects. Um, like th that make this development constantly uh, navigate this temporal states of illegality. So what do we mean actually by degrees of illegality? If you uh, try to think about like from urban studies perspective, we we used to be to, uh, to be taught about how there are public spaces, there are private spaces, but there are also spaces in between. There are semi-private spaces and there are, for example, semi-public spaces. And we would like to argue uh, by looking at housing illegality and the global north as a condition, as Jonas mentioned earlier, that there are degrees of illegality and sometimes there are not so legal or not so illegal. So in other words, semi-legal and semi-illegal uh, actions or events that can take place with regards not only to housing, but more bro broadly as a perspective of looking at urbanism and cities. So in this sense, um, the rule of law would become a, as a flexible and temporary condition by a, by a neoliberal state, which is at the end of the day argued to be for uh, socialists. Um, we would like to uh, direct the, the conversation more into discussing our methodologies. We, we welcome, like this is an in-progress paper, uh, we would welcome any suggestion with regard to which methodologies to use to um, towards moving towards understanding the detabooing of informality and illegality and the degrees of uh, illegality. And if anyone would interested to join our focus groups, um, we will share in the link if the um, organizers would allow us to share your contact information. And last but not least, we would like to ask Joanna if um, if there are any insights from um, Barso in general from your work on the legal technologies um, of primitive accumulation. Thank you so much. <laughs>